Good morning, friends. Thank you for being with us this special morning. Um, and I want to just join first in sharing the hope that those of you without power right now will soon have it again. Thank you again for being with us uh, today and this morning. And my name is Tony Coleman, and I serve as one of First Congo's associate pastors. And this morning, I want to think with you about the question of where we find God particularly when things get hard. Let me start by painting a picture. It's the 1890s in New Orleans, a Southern city, an American city like no other with wildly different groups of people all making home in the same blocks and bars and buildings. There were the formerly enslaved black folks who found joy in the rhythms and poetry of spirituals and ragtime this was a community made up of people who had, until very recently in that time, been taken and traded like any other commodity in the 19th century economy. They were forced to adopt the language and religion of their owners, people who spoke English and went to church. So that's what they did. By 1890, though, these people had taken the culture they were forced to adopt, and they had made it their own developing their own expressions of music and faith. Then there was another black community in New Orleans too, a Creole elite. They traced their lineage to the free people of color who had lived in Louisiana since before it was part of the United States. They had a racially and culturally mixed heritage. They spoke French in addition to English and they sent their children to Europe to learn about art, manners and music. They practiced Catholicism and they accumulated wealth and property in New Orleans. However, after the Supreme Court said that segregation was constitutional, the status of all black folks in New Orleans, regardless of who they were, where they came from or what languages they spoke, changed. The Louisiana legislature joined states around the country in passing law after law that further defined what it meant to be black, creating sometimes elaborate legal definitions and categories that focused on having even just a drop of black blood coursing through your veins. Suddenly, in the eyes of the law, what had been a rich diversity of blackness got flattened into a vilified other. Over the time, both before formalized segregation and certainly during it, the traditions and cultures of New Orleans Black communities started to blend. The rhythms of spirituals and the drumming traditions of formerly enslaved folks mixed with European-influenced harmonics and melodies. Six-stringed instruments that you strum met four-stringed instruments that you bow. And over time, a distinct musical genre formed. Out of some of the most painful travesties of American history, out of slavery's violence and oppression, out of Jim Crow's separation and segregation, out of the tragedies this country has rained down on African Americans, jazz was born. It should come as no surprise then that improvisation is a hallmark of jazz music. Given the fact that it grew out of a history of having to adapt, it makes perfect sense that jazz is all about listening and responding and creating with nothing but sheer intuition to guide your way. Whether we call it improvisation or just plain old survival, all of us know in one way or another what it means to make life up as we go. We all know what it means to have to listen and respond and create without a plan. That is, in fact, what today's scripture is all about. It's a scene from the life of Joseph, a man with 12 siblings and a dreamer, the Bible tells us. He was a person whom vivid and elaborate visions would visit in his sleep. He was his father's favorite, the Bible also tells us, and his siblings hated him. They hated Joseph's dreams. They hated Joseph being the favorite, and they wanted to be rid of him. So they sold him into slavery, 
as one did to people one did not like in those days, apparently. After that, Joseph became an Egyptian official's personal servant and worked in his house for a period of time before landing in prison. Things were not going well for Joseph, but he kept doing what he knew to do. He dreamt. And he interpreted the dreams of others. He interpreted the dreams of the people imprisoned with him. And before too long, he found himself in Pharaoh's presence, interpreting the Egyptian monarch's dreams too. Having impressed the Pharaoh, Joseph became an Egyptian official himself and enjoyed wealth, status, and a family of his own. In a matter of years then, Joseph went from being one among 12 siblings, siblings who betrayed and enslaved him, to being one of the most powerful people in the ancient world. All along the way, Joseph suffered. He experienced heartbreak and unimaginable pain. And as a result, all along the way we can imagine, Joseph may have been wondering, where is God? Along the way of suffering injustice, enslavement, and betrayal, amidst the separation from his family and the oppression of his imprisonment and the travesties of his life, we can imagine that Joseph may have asked more than once, where is God? It's a relatable question, isn't it? When observing Joseph's story or American history or the trials and tribulations of our own lives, we can find ourselves asking that question, where might God be in all of this? One of the most common ways people answer this question is, I think, also one of the most common reasons people give up on God. When confronted with pain and suffering and the inevitable desire to understand why it's happening, folks all too often lay the responsibility on God. God is testing you, folk might say. God works in mysterious ways. God is preparing you to receive a better blessing. God is having you go through this bad thing, the theology goes, so that you can be prepared for this good thing that is going to come. The idea is that at best, God is using our life's dramas and traumas in the service of some grander plan that leads to something good. At worst though, God is using our pain to punish us. What if though, what if instead of spending our lives trying to make excuses for the bad times by seeing them as punishment or actually good times in disguise? What if instead of cutting up our experience into bad notes and good ones, we took a lesson from jazz? What jazz exemplifies is an entirely unique way of approaching what comes at us. We take life. We take joy and pain and suffering. We take harmony and dissonance and disruption. We take confusion and resolve and hope. We take all of life and we find a way to make music. And maybe that's where God is. Maybe instead of God being some all-powerful deity who wills us pain as punishment or test, God is something more. Maybe instead of being an entity who causes tragedy to teach lessons or prepare souls, God is something else. Maybe, maybe God isn't why we come to our pain, but instead God is how we get through our pain. Today, we read about the end of Joseph's story, his final meeting with his siblings. After all the suffering and eventual success, after the betrayal and the eventual triumph, Joseph and his brothers are reunited. Before his brothers arrived, they sent a message to Joseph telling him that their father's last wish was that Joseph forgive them. 
deeply moved, the Bible tells us Joseph wept. When his brothers finally arrived, they threw themselves at Joseph's feet and pled for their lives. Joseph responded, do not be afraid. You intended to harm me, Joseph tells them, but God intended it for good. So don't be afraid. It's easy to see this story as an instance of God causing bad to make good. Easy to read Joseph's story as an example of how God tested and tried Joseph in order to bring him eventually to wealth and power. However, I don't believe God really works that way. Certainly not for the sake of something as mundane as wealth and power. Perhaps God wasn't the out of sight puppet master pulling all the strings, but Instead, perhaps God was in Joseph's dreams. Perhaps God was in Joseph's resolve and faith to keep going. Perhaps God was in the tears that Joseph cried when he received his brother's plea for forgiveness. Perhaps God was in the relief Joseph's brothers felt when he forgave them. Perhaps God was the improvised rhythm behind the twists and turns of Joseph's story. The energy and spirit that one day brought a broken and out of sync family back together. When bad things happen to us, it is easy to ask why. Why God, why did my marriage fail? Why did that diagnosis come? Why didn't my parents love me the way I needed and deserved? Pain happens and we want to know why. Perhaps instead though, instead at least sometimes, what we can do is move from asking why to asking how from why did this happen to how can I keep moving? We could move from the place of trying to make sense of our pain to letting it be part of how we make meaning in our lives. We can improvise. We can let God take us into the discordant places and the chaotic rhythms and the broken melodies and the confusing chords and we can make something, friends, like jazz. We can let life play on and we can let God show us how to make our way through it. May it be so and amen. We now worship God as we present our offerings.
When I think of what you've done Every sin you've overcome That you would do it all again Oh, I will never comprehend In love you I'm in love with you I've never known love like this So beautiful I'll never get used to this My heart is yours Of this I am convinced From now If you're wondering why I'm in such a luscious and plush environment, it's because my um, my power is still off. Now that's not my spiritual power; that's my electrical power, and uh, so it, it is with great pleasure and appreciation that um, I accepted an invitation to come be at my cousin's home. And I thought I could open the blinds and have you look out on the many wonderful trees in her yard, but um, I had to relocate. And so the traditional tapestry of the communion serving, the communion table, Jesus at the Last Supper, that you often see when I'm here uh, for worship is not with me today. Um, but um, it's in my heart because it's something I brought from South Africa on my first trip. So it's another way to say, God is good all the time. As we look at Alicia Curry and her son singing to us, we are reminded that indeed we are a community congregation. We leave room for every voice, every face, every thought, and every heart. So let us join together as we recite 
our affirmation and community that you will see now on your screens. We will be together. We will stand as brothers and sisters given life by one God. We will be together. We will watch out for one another. We will listen to what needs to be said in a spirit of compassion. We will respect the power of silence. We will wait for the slowest. We will sooner or later catch up with the fastest. We will dry the tears of those who are weeping and know that they will dry ours when the time comes. We will let ourselves begin to feel at least a little of the pain of those we have considered our enemies. We will entrust our stories to each other. We will not be skeptical that peace can come. We will not forget the joy of life. We will not forget to be grateful. We will do our best to stir in each other hope, courage, and faith. Will you pray with me this morning? God, the kaleidoscope of creation, who makes millions of patterns and models with so few materials, we praise you in all. Each of us made, is made in your image and each uniquely different. We are created to do good works and to be the good in the world you created. We boldly choose to seek and invite the bad with peacock performance perfection. That prompts you to demonstrate the power of godliness over the good and the bad that stalk us. Godliness is your godliness. Your godliness breaks us, makes us, molds us into the multidimensional image of who you are. It is the finishing touch of our spiritual creation. It looks nothing like the human creation we strive so hard to become. We learn to resist and reverse revenge. We learn to ask humbly for forgiveness and to graciously extend forgiveness, no matter the violation. And when we allow you to order our steps, we find our path to your godliness for each of us. For that journey, we express our gratitude. It is with gratitude for blessings. We love and accept all who question your existence or your power. And now we offer prayers for the known and unknown needs of the family, friends, and strangers among us. Mike Robertson's mother continues to improve in the hospital with rehab her next step. Pastor Cheryl is going strong to rehab full speed ahead with positive, encouraging results. Mm, baby Alma June Nowitzki is doing well after her surgery last week and grandmothers Julia and Catherine have brought her smiles now. Heavenly parent, we are so full of lament, joy and gratefulness since last week we gathered for worship. Some folks didn't survive the cold, the, violet, the isolation, the hunger, the stress of icy winter storms. Some folks retreated with loved ones for fun, inventive meals and moments for recreation. Some folks created new support networks for such a time as this. We give thanks for your presence in all the storms of light, all the way to the very end. Now in our personal silence, we allow our bodies to express gratitude, the gratitude that we feel as we prepare ourselves for the table of new beginnings. Amen. Good morning. 
One of the most sacred ways we affirm our life together and celebrate the power of God's love as Christians is to join together in this sacrament of communion. I invite, and I invite you now to gather your bread along with your wine or grape juice or water, or simply join in this community of faith in a spirit of holy attention as we join together in communion. Communion is about the sacred power we have to connect and overcome our separations from each other. It's about overcoming divisive boundaries. It's about remembering that each of us is a child of God. It's about overcoming the separations caused even by physical distance and chronological time. As we share together in this ritual that has taken place for thousands of years around the globe among people of faith, we use this sharing as a way of entering into the story of Jesus's life and as the spiritual movement that he began. Let us join together in remembering and reenacting this story as you remain muted and read the words on your screen out loud. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he sat at supper with his disciples. While they were eating, he took a piece of bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body, it is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat now as Jesus ate with his disciples. Jesus then took his cup and said, this cup is God's new covenant. Drink it to remember me. In that same way, let us drink together now as Jesus drank with his disciples. In this act of communion, eating and drinking together, remembering and living into what Jesus did, we name ourselves as not only followers of Jesus, but as beloved children of God in Christ's new and divine covenant. While our world may try to convince us that love is something we can purchase or sell, win or take, conquer or destroy, we remember that God, that love, is already with us forever. I invite you now to join with me in singing the Lord's Prayer as we pray to God, our Father, our Mother in Heaven.
Let us now recite our covenant prayer together. We covenant with the Lord and with one another and do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in all his ways, according as he is pleased to reveal himself unto us in his blessed word of truth. And let us go forth, friends, into the rest of our week, ready to find God wherever God may be, ready to improvise, ready to make jazz. Amen. Let's join now in singing together our final hymn. Happy Sunday, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It was great to see you. Beautiful message. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Tony, it was great. Uh, Tony. Yes. Tony. Thank you, Tony. Tony. Thank you. Thank Alicia, you, Tony. great music. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. Yes. yes. Alicia and Eli did a fantastic job. <laughs> And that video is so adorable too. At first, when I see, saw, um, you know, our little little Curry coming in there, I was like, oh, Zoom bombing. <laughs> but then he started singing. It was amazing. Yeah, you know? it really was. You know, I grew up in a musical family. Almost everybody in my family sang, and uh, but we never sang with each other ever. There was no singing in the house when anybody else was home, and. I always thought that if I had kids, which I didn't, um, <laughs> that I would sing with them. Yes. So what I did was instead I, I picked one up from the choir and the singing was built in. <laughs> there you go. Right. <laughs> How's he doing, funny. by the way? He's doing really well. He's uh, he started back in college. Uh, uh, he's, he's stationed in Honolulu. He's got a banker's hour job for the first time. Oh. Uh, so 
<laughs> he's starting picking up his college classes again. He wants to finish his degree. Nice. He's That's getting great. really grown up. <laughs> <laughs> we miss our Warren. As big as a fan I, I am of, of jazz, and then, you know, that's my little ego, jazz is. Yeah. 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 Did you not bring it home today? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad that, that it felt that way. I see. So yeah, now we have to just, I think I've inspired my family to be listening to jazz. They're down there, I think, listening to Wynton Marsalis right now. <laughs> All right. 